I'm Leah Small, and this is Virginia Voices, where you will hear first-person stories from people most affected by current politics, policy, and economic trends. We give Virginians outside the news a full stage to explore their thoughts and experiences beyond a few sound bites or paragraphs in a daily news story. Virginia Voices is a project of the Virginia Center for Investigative Journalism at WHRO. Yudith Shamir raised her son as a single mother in New York City in the late 80s. It was a lonely struggle. Shamir grew up in Queens, the daughter of Jewish parents of Eastern European descent. As an adult, she began to explore her faith and its spiritual connection to Israel. From Israeli friends, Shamir learned about the concept of kibbutzim, small communal towns often supported by collective farming. She and her 10-year-old son immigrated to Israel and settled in Kisifim, a tranquil kibbutz near the border of the Gaza Strip. She married her husband, Shmuel, under the white cloth of a traditional chuppah. She learned Hebrew and, during bike rides, stopped to pick figs ripened by the desert sun. The family later moved to Virginia, but always visited Kisufim, the last time on October 6th. A day later, Hamas militants from Palestine waged a deadly assault targeting Kisufim and other communities in southern Israel, killing nearly 1,200 people. Militants took more than 200 Israeli hostages, and retaliatory strikes by Israel have killed at least 39,000 Palestinians, the Gaza Health Ministry says. The Israeli-Hamas war is the bloodiest conflict in the multi-generational fighting between Israelis and Palestinians. Shamir, now 74, lost family and friends in the attacks. She shared with us the story of her life in Israel, grief and personal loss amid the war, and her hope for peace. October 6th actually is not a bad place to start because I was in Israel with my husband and my daughter and her husband and their baby who was 10 months old at the time. Um, we were there visiting family and friends. We had been there for just a few days, and as we always do when we go, we go annually, and we gather our family together for a reunion, the close family, which is a lot of people, and that's what we did on October 6th in the evening. The weather was perfect. Earlier that day, we went out to the beach to just see the Mediterranean. It was always, always just so relaxing and so joyful and came back, the, the party was actually late afternoon, and it was in a, a park not far from where we were staying. It was wonderful to be able to introduce our granddaughter to her cousins and other relatives. My granddaughter, who, is, who has always been a delight and continues to be so, was just very comfortable meeting all these new people, smiling at everybody, didn't mind being passed around a little bit. <laughs> and she especially liked meeting a couple of the younger cousins. So that was very, very nice to, to see that happening. And it was just, it was a beautiful day. The, the, the seventh was, uh, was a nightmare. It was just a nightmare. I grew up in New York City in uh, a neighborhood in Queens that was kind of working class, middle, middle class area with quite a bit of diversity. I was brought up basically secular Jewish. My grandparents were the immigrants. I was second generation. My grandparents were from an area of Russia that is now probably part of Ukraine or Poland. They came at the beginning of the 20th century to the United States. My parents grew up being more religious, but as adults, they moved away from religion, but brought their Jewishness and their values to politics, where they were part of what was then the, the new left fighting for democracy, fighting against fascism. Later, when I was a single parent of a, of a young son, and I realized that I had moved away from kind of any interest in Real Things Jewish, but I realized that I wanted him to have some knowledge of his roots and his identity. And so I started also sending him to a Sunday school program and I started learning more. And then we had very good friends who were neighbors who were 
from Israel. They were just spending a few years in the United States to get some education in a new field and then to move back. So I learned a lot about Israel from them and also got interested in Israeli songs and Israeli folk dance. And it was when my son was about 10 years old that I realized that raising him as a single parent in New York City was a very difficult thing. Didn't really have family support around me. And I was very concerned and wanted to be in a place where I would feel more supported and more of a sense of community. Part of my process of learning about Israel was learning about kibbutz life. And kibbutz really resonated with me because it's a communal living. It respects people's abilities and skills, that they give what they can, what's most appropriate for them in terms of work, and everyone is equal within that framework. And children are very precious in the kibbutz, and everybody cares about them. So I decided that I was going to move to Israel in order to settle on a kibbutz. That's a huge decision, even overseas as a single parent. But you had so much faith in the sense of community. You felt you would get there. Did it meet your expectations? I would say it exceeded expectations. <laughs> I was 32. Most of my family thought I was crazy, but I felt at home immediately in a way that it, I could never say I really felt at home in the United States. Not that I didn't feel at home, feel American, but in some ways I was always a bit different or I was an outsider. Just simple things like you, you know, you walk around at Christmas time and everyone is saying Merry Christmas and that's very lovely. You know, it's a, it's a good wish, but, you know, but Christmas isn't my holiday. Why are they saying Merry Christmas to me? When I was in Israel, every Friday, people would greet each other with Shabbat Shalom and wish, wish each other a peaceful Shabbat. And didn't matter, you didn't have to be religious or anything, but that was, that was the greeting. And the language is Hebrew, and I loved learning Hebrew. And the, the holidays are celebrated in, in a variety of ways. There are the, those religious observances. Kibbutz celebrates holidays in different ways, in ways that are just, just wonderful. I was very fortunate to be living in, in Kisufim at a time that was relatively peaceful. There were terrorist attacks in the, in the cities. There had been incidents not long before I got to Kisufim. People used to be able to go from Kisufim to Gaza to do some shopping and just, just go there without any issues. So there were, there were relationships there. There was a sense of fair amount of security. And I would say something that's, you know, unique about Israel and I've heard other people say too is you can be any nationality. You're Jewish. This is our community we welcome you. And I imagine that feeling so warm. Can you speak to the cultural significance of Israel for Jewish people and how you felt really feel connected to that? One of the things that, that was very interesting in the, in the kibbutz, in Kisufim, was that there were people from all over. There was a, a large contingent of people who had come from Argentina. There were others who had grown up in Israel and were native Israelis. There were people from Iraq who had been forced out of their homes when the state of Israel was born. In some of the, the Middle Eastern countries where there were Jewish communities, people were forced out. They had to leave everything, and many of them came to Israel. You met your husband. Yes. On the kibbutz. How did you meet him? One of my friends there asked whether I was interested in meeting someone, and I said yes. She actually was originally from Kisufim and is a kind of a distant relative of my husband. So she introduced the two of us, and we started seeing each other. Very soon after we started seeing each other, and before we were really thinking seriously, everyone around us was saying, so which kibbutz are you going to settle on? <laughs> they they just do. decided <laughs> we, we were going to get married, and we figured they were right. His family was wonderful. They welcomed me right away. As soon as I moved there, I started working in a kindergarten. I have a background in early childhood education. The kids taught me the language. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I had learned quite a bit, but when you're working with like four and five-year-olds and you have to help them get showered and dressed and wake them up in the morning and feed them, you know, the, prepare the food and all of that, you're talking about things. And if you don't know what those things are called, the kids are really happy to help you. They think there's, that it's very funny that you don't know how to speak.
There was an incident where a few of the kibbutz members had gone to, to do some shopping and a bomb was placed in their car. And when they were, I think it was when they were on their way back that the bomb exploded and two of the, two of the people were killed. I think there were two others who survived the attack. And there were other stories like that of, you know, and other people that were missing from the kibbutz who had died in, in the wars and that kind of thing. So it was, it was always around us. There's a Memorial Day that is observed in Israel right before the Independence Day. And that's a very solemn day. And there's, and there's always a very, a, a connection, a very personal connection to people that have fallen in the various battles. At that time, we just sort of lived with the knowledge that we weren't at peace, but there were a lot of people who were working towards peace. And so there was more of a sense of hope than there is right now. You eventually decided to leave. Can you talk about why and did any of that danger factor into your decision? It didn't. Um, it wasn't, that wasn't the issue. There were a lot of, a lot of changes that were going on economically and socially within the kibbutz that were of concern, and there were changes in the country that were political and economic. And our daughter at that time was, when, when we left, she was almost four. And so it was a point in our lives where we were looking at, you know, what, is, what does the future hold for us? It was heartbreaking, and it was very hard with the family, especially with my husband's sister and her husband, who, you know, had, had basically raised him from his teenage years and who were, we were very, very close to. And they were founders of the kibbutz and had devoted their lives to establishing the, the kibbutz. It was heartbreaking for them to see us leave. And, and it, just, it just hurt. It hurt all of us. my husband's nephew, whose name is Ofer. Ofer was like a brother to, to my husband. He lived in Kibbutz Kisufim, which was founded by his parents. There were many relatives that were living there. But at this time, in October, my nephew, who is a bachelor, still lived there, and an older cousin as well. So Ofer was with us on October 6th, and our plan was for the next day that my husband and I were going to take our granddaughter to visit him in the kibbutz and then go and visit some other friends who were also in a community uh, in the south along the Gaza border. Kisufim is just across the Gaza border from the city of Dior Balach. And that was our plan for the day. And at 6.30 in the morning on October 7th, sirens began to sound all over Israel. We ran to the safe room. Israelis are very well practiced at doing that. And then we began to hear all of the reports of what was going on, and it was coming in gradually throughout the day, understanding that there had been a, just a horrific massacre of people in the kibbutzim on, on the border with Gaza and also in other small towns uh, and, and cities along the border. We kept trying to reach Ofer, and there was no telephone connection. What sort of man was Ofer? What was he like? A really sweet, gentle person. He had a lot of health issues, and that was in part a reason that he never found a partner in life. He remained in the kibbutz, and he was a hard worker and loved family. He loved Israeli music. He had a tremendous collection. And in fact, after we left Israel and came here, when he came to visit us, he brought cassettes that he had made for us that were filled with all kinds of songs that he loved and he knew that we loved it as well. So it was just lovely. And then somewhat later in life, he really got an interest in photography as well. He was a sweet, peace-loving, family-loving person. Never hurt anybody. It was several days before we were able to get confirmation that he had in fact been murdered, as well as the, the cousin who lived next door 
another friend of ours was also in, in Kisufin was killed that day and um, and another friend was taken hostage and we have no idea what his status is at this point. It was the start of just for us about two weeks of horror within the country. The horror continued after that and certainly for anybody that was still in the country but during those two weeks we were repeatedly running to the safe room several times a day because of incoming fire. The news was on constantly. We kept hearing reports of what had been going on and we were busy arranging or my, my daughter and her husband were trying to find flights out of the country because they were supposed to, we were all supposed to be there for about three weeks. It took a long time to be able to find anything to get out and they did, but we were staying because we were waiting to be able to bury our nephew and it took a good two weeks before his body was released for burial and we were able the following day to get out. My nephew's sister had a friend who knew someone who was a singer and who offered to sing a couple of songs that Ofer loved at his funeral. He loved Israeli songs and about 60 or 70 members of the Philharmonic and related musicians showed up at the funeral unrehearsed accompanied the, the singers on these two songs. They were lined up surrounding all of us who were there for the funeral to mourn. And it was, it was astounding and very, very moving. And they, I believe they went on and did the same thing at some other funerals, but this was, this was the first. And they realized how much it meant to all of us and to them as well to just be joined in, in a moment of such intense grieving. to finally get home weeks later. I guess you're only but so relieved to be home. I mean, it's the feeling still lingers of being there. How does it feel to have that and to hear news reports of the continued war and also what's happening to Palestinians as far as bombings and famine? When we first got back, it was very surreal. It was just so strange to be walking around in, in a country where nobody, everyone was living their lives as usual. Nobody was thinking about war, about people being killed. I, I felt like some kind of a, an alien in an alien world. And it took a very long time to get past that. I do continue with my life, you know, for doing, doing the usual things, but it's always with me. I wake up in the morning before I even get out of bed, I'm looking at the news from Israel to see what's going on. It's the primary thing that, that I think about even in terms of when I'm looking at politics or I'm looking at the way that people are relating to each other and certainly the way that people are uh, in the United States are responding to what happened there, which is tremendously disturbing. It's just very upsetting that even, even the day after the massacre occurred, before Israel had taken any kind of action in response, there were people demonstrating and saying, great job, Hamas, and is Israel deserved this. And you know, it was, it was Israel's fault that this happened. There has been conflict there for a long time. And I'm not one to say that Israel does everything right and the Palestinians do everything wrong. But there was no justification for that massacre. And you actually started your piecework in Virginia, right? When I retired and gotten involved politically to some extent, but, but also through my synagogue, I became a representative of the synagogue in a group called Interfaith Communities for Dialogue, which is a group that started out after 9-11 with a group of Christians, Muslims, and Jews who wanted to create a connections and mutual support 
to be able to speak out for one another. There was a lot of Islamophobia at that point. And they felt if they established connections and learned more about one another when nothing terrible was going on, that that would also serve if anything happened that, that you know, you just naturally pull together. And that's, that certainly has been the case. So we're, we're trying to, to build on that with the, the hope that they, that they get into a group with people who are different from them, you know, not just saying, oh, here's my group of friends and having that conversation. How did the dialogues change amid the Israeli-Hamas war on October 7th? I had had personal conversations with two of the Muslim women se separately who are on the board and who are friends and see, uh, see the, the situation differently. I would say that both of them were very focused on the suffering of the, of the children in Gaza. For them, it drove everything about what they thought needed to happen next. Basically saying, the war needs to stop now. Every, no matter what, it just needs, the, the fighting needs to stop because we need to protect those children. And I completely understand their, where they're coming from. It's horrible to be seeing that children and women and other innocent people are suffering in Gaza. They're not getting enough food. Their homes are being destroyed. They're being moved from one place to another. I get it, it's terrible. My perspective is, you know, and I had expressed it to them in our separate conversations, is that it can't be an unconditional ceasefire. The hostages need to be released. That's an absolute. And when we talk about the effect on children, we need to understand that the children are being very deeply traumatically affected on both sides of that border. Children on the, in, the, in Israel have been subject to rocket attacks from before October 7th, there was supposedly a ceasefire in place, but there would periodically be rockets fired into the kibbutzim and into Sterot and other places. And how much more so now, after October 7th, children that saw members of their family being murdered in front of them and being brutalized and having to leave their homes and thousands of people are still, you know, they've evacuated their homes. They can't go back to the places on the border or places in the north now as well. If Hamas is still able to do the next massacre against Israelis, to continue their fight against Israel, and if they're able to continue being the governing force and killing Palestinians who dare to speak up, preventing them from being able to move their lives forward, then nobody on either side is ever going to have peace. It would just be, once again, you know, a, a temporary kind of ceasefire, and we'd be back starting the whole thing all over again. And to me, that's not a solution. It's a tragic dilemma to, to be facing. I don't want anybody else to die, but I, I look for a solution that's going to, to look towards a future process. What would that solution be to you? What do you want for both Israelis and Palestinians? What does peace require? If the Palestinians talk about from the river to the sea, that everything is going to be theirs, Israel, Israelis are not gonna say, okay, we'll just walk away. There are, there are Israelis, extremist Israelis, who are saying the same thing with, a, with, the other, with the opposite meaning. Neither side can get what they want as long as they stick with their extreme positions and say it's all or nothing. I really believe there needs to be an international commitment to saying enough is enough. We're gonna help the peoples that are living in this area to finally do what, what was the intent really of the United Nations originally, which was to say they're, they're dividing the land. Wasn't, they didn't consult with the people who lived there. That's a real problem. But they said, Here, here's a land for the Palestinians. Here's a land for the Israelis. We need to be able to do that. There have been multiple opportunities. We've come to the brink a number of times of, of thinking there would be peace. And you know, once again, I think now is the time. I, don't believe that, that it can wait any longer. I have actually gone to a, a couple of, of dialogues that were organized by another group that's called the Jewish Islamic D Dialogue Society. I'm very glad that they do it. I think these things, you know, I'll, I'll just keep going to them. I think it's absolutely necessary to get people in a room who, at the very least, you know, they're, they're there. They say, you know, I don't agree with you, but here I am, and, and we should be talking. That's a start.
I'm host and producer Leah Small. Virginia Voices is a project of the Virginia Center for Investigative Journalism at WHRO. Executive producers are Christopher Tyree and Lewis Hansen. The podcast is edited by Chris and myself. Virginia Voices is made possible through a grant by Virginia Humanities and donors like you. You can read the story and see photos from today's show and past episodes on our website, vcij.org, which is linked in our bio. We hope that if you like these conversations, you'll subscribe to Virginia Voices, where we'll continue to share the stories of Virginia citizens whose lives are impacted by the news of the day. On behalf of everyone here at the Virginia Center for Investigative Journalism, thank you for your time and support.